We're back now with our Sunday politics panel. Susan Page is USA Today's Washington bureau chief. Rayhan Salam is executive editor of the National Review. Audie Cornish is host of All Things Considered at NPR. And Dan Balls is chief correspondent at The Washington Post. Rayhan, I want to start with you. What have we learned about Donald Trump from the people he's picked? Well, we've learned that he's drawing on a very broad array of people, ranging from loyalists to a lot of Republican regulars. Uh, I found the pick of Elaine Chao as Secretary of Transportation to be a particularly telling one. Elaine Chao is not someone who is an old school Donald Trump loyalist, uh, yet she is someone who had served in cabinet before as Secretary of Labor, and she is, of course, also the wife of the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Mitch McConnell. So that is a sign that, hey, maybe transportation is indeed a very high priority, and he is thinking about legislation strategy. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, you have the um, designate for Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who distinguished himself by being an early staunch supporter and someone who's really shaped Donald Trump's views uh, on immigration policy. So I'd say that, you know, those are two ends of the spectrum, a loyalist and also someone who is going to be facilitating Trump's uh, ostensible future role as a deal maker. Dan, do you think we have an administration shaping up where Donald Trump goes out and does what he did with the carrier deal, has a big flashing moment and leaves the details to other people? Or what do we know in terms of, or can we know even at this part, uh, at this point about the kind of uh, separation of duties between Donald Trump and the people he picks to head these departments or even his vice president? John, I think there's still a lot we won't know until he's actually in power. We've, we are beginning to see some signs of it. And I think in, in certainly in the terms of the cabinet picks and the kinds of things he's done, there's the two Donald Trumps, some of which we saw during the campaign. There is a Donald Trump on the one hand who is unpredictable, uh, who likes to mix it up, who wants to stir the pot, um, who will continue to tweet things that will upset people. Um, and we also saw at certain times in the campaign, and we're seeing in the selection of the cabinet, a Donald Trump who in some ways comes off as a generic Republican. And I think that that's the, going to be the tension within a Trump administration, which is the more significant who's really running things, is he really running it, or is he being guided by others, particularly those uh, sort of in the Republican mainstream? My guess is that Donald Trump will continue to try to shake things up. Uh, Susan, Newt Gingrich, who's been a critic of Mitt Romney for Secretary of State, seemed to be, in our conversation with him today, maybe okay about Mitt Romney uh, being Secretary of State. What do you make of that post in particular? It's, it's taken longer. There's been this public conversation about it. Some, sometimes it seems like messages are coming to Donald Trump from his staff through the televisions. What do you think is going on there? I think it's interesting and not surprising that he's taking a little time with Secretary of State. No more important appointment that he'll make. And you see the com competition between a loyalist, somebody who was with him, Rudy Giuliani, and his fiercest critic, uh, uh, Mitt Romney. I do think that there are signs that they're looking for maybe some additional names. Uh, and one name I've heard is John Huntsman, the uh, former ambassador to China for Barack Obama, a guy who ran for president himself, not so successfully for the Republican ticket, but someone who was not never part of the Never Trump movement, uh, has some foreign policy experience. So I wonder if they're having, maybe the standoff between Giuliani and Romney has created an opening for a third person to walk through, whether it be Huntsman or Bob Corker or someone else. Audie, one question I wondered about was, I asked Ryan's previous about this claim Donald Trump made about millions of votes being cast in California. And the reason I asked is uh, there's no evidence of that. And yet, Priebus was in the position of basically defending his boss in that case. Um, but going to Dan's point about the two different Donald Trumps, um, what, what, how, does this, how does the presidency accommodate this when the president says things? I thought the point about the two different uh, Trumps was interesting because the Trump I'm seeing most is like, the one we know from The Apprentice. I mean, like the cabinet process feels like a reality show. You've got these people traipsing in and out. In fact, it's more like The Bachelor. Like somebody's gonna get a rose. You have that photo of Romney at that romantically lit dinner, which like looked very awkward. Uh, and at the end of the day, somebody is gonna get tapped. But one question is, if you take a position with the Trump administration, how much say do you have? Like, right, will you be listened to? Will you be respected? What are the ramifications if you decide you can't do it anymore and want to resign or want to step aside? I think anybody who wanted the State Department job, for instance, and saw what happened with Taiwan in the last you know, week is probably thinking, what does it mean to take this gig? You know what struck me, though, in the months since the election is, you know that civil war that I and others predicted in the Republican Party? <laughs> That isn't happening. This is yeah, Donald I heard Trump. Well, Trump. Well, Trump. Part yes, of victory. Yeah. Victory tends to make so everybody. So you have so and, and Donald Trump has actually been pretty skilled, I think, in both 
rewarding loyalty with some, but not with everybody. Giuliani still didn't have a job. Forgive, not forgiving everybody, maybe, but forgiving some of the people who were pretty critical of him during the campaign. This is Donald Trump's party. This is Donald Trump's administration. And while he's somebody that we can see already is willing to delegate, especially to Mike Pence. Mike Pence has emerged as well, a really powerful figure. This is his administration. To offer a somewhat different perspective, I think about this through the lens of the past. So if you think about Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, here were two figures who in a lot of ways were very unconventional Democrats. Jimmy Carter ran really in opposition to the Democratic Party in lots of ways. He was a very idiosyncratic figure, and actually his Democratic coalition was very different from the Democratic coalition that emerged in later years. And he struggled as president. He was a you know governor from Georgia who came in without the support of the Congressional Democratic Party. So that was kind of a disaster. Uh, at least some would say. If you look at Bill Clinton, it was a very different situation. Bill Clinton ran as a populist, as a new Democrat. The trouble is that there were no new Democrats. There were no actual cadres. There were maybe 15, 20, 30 people. So he could not actually staff his administration with people who represented his particular worldview. He wound up staffing it with some retreads from the Carter administration, a lot of fairly conventional liberals, and then there was a fight in the party. But basically, he wound up being not a populist Democrat, but you could say a bit of a Wall Street Democrat. It was Robert Rubin who defined mm. the Clinton presidency. So similarly with Trump, you can imagine a scenario in which, like Jimmy Carter, he kind of fights tooth and nail against his party. You can imagine another scenario in which he essentially gets assimilated to the kind of power brokers of his party. And then maybe there's a third case, but the problem with the third case in which he advances his distinctive nationalism and populism, the problem with that third case is that you need cadres, you need actual Trumpists in order for that to happen. And maybe Steve Bannon is not a Trumpist, maybe there are a handful of other people who are Trumpists, but it's not really clear that he has the people to staff those 4,000 jobs in his administration to advance that distinctive perspective. So I see the Clinton scenario or the Carter scenario as the two things that work right now. Unless his perspective is whatever works at the time, and then everybody's just trying to get a result, well, and, and it's not a specific result. Yeah, and that could be, okay, that you're just given to the power brokers of the party. Well, let me ask you, Audio, about this uh, deal that Donald Trump worked with uh, with Carrier this week. Um, he said he was going to punish them, but they got seven million in tax breaks. What did you make of this at the end of the day? Um, I think it's interesting that Trump has rejected the kind of checklist that Republicans have. I think, Dan, you've written about this, like him being kind of uh, independent, and therefore he doesn't have to do the, like, free market, can't do that, right? So all of a sudden, that's okay. Uh, and I think it, maybe we could see, or I think the thing I'll be looking for is, will that change the atmosphere for corporate decision making? If you have a president who is not constricted by uh, all of those kind of party dynamics, that creates some uncertainty. Uh, and who knows kind of how they could take that going forward. What do you think, Dan, about this? Are we going to see Donald Trump basically, is this the model for his presidency, these kinds of high profile, hands on, but in a, a limited way? Well, Donald Trump is a showman yeah. and he likes to create these moments and we've seen him do it throughout the campaign. And I, I can't imagine that uh, given his age and his experience that he's going to fundamentally change the way he approaches this new job, even though it's totally different than anything he's done. I think on the issue of the, of the carrier case, the question is, what signals does that send outside of that particular episode? Uh, is, it, is it incentives to other companies to try to come in and bargain with him? Uh, does it create some sense of intimidation that the President of the United States is going to call you out if he sees you doing something that he doesn't like? I think that everybody is going to be making judgments based on a handful of so symbolic but, but real things that he does early on in his tenure, and they will begin to calibrate how they deal with him from there. It's fascinating to see the opposition because on the one hand you have Larry Summers, very prominent Democrat, who's saying that, hey, this isn't the rule of law, this isn't free market. And of course he never mentions that. People said the same thing about the auto bailout, right? right. And then you have Bernie Sanders saying, this isn't punitive enough, this isn't hard enough on the corporations, it's just a, a huge giveaway. So wait, which is it going to be? Uh, and I think that in that, is room for maneuver for Trump. Right. And There's you have Sarah Palin calling it crony capitalism, right, so indeed. you have it. There's no ideological point. test for Donald Trump. He is not an ideological guy. He is whatever the result is. Maybe it's whatever looks good. Uh, I mean, and that gives him, it seems to me, tremendous sway and probably a great deal of irritation for other Republicans in Washington. All right, we're going to cut it there for a moment, and we'll be right back. Stay with us. And we're back now with more from our politics panel. Audie, I want to ask you about Nancy Pelosi was here, the Democratic leader, reelected as a Democratic leader. She said she respects the office of the presidency. A lot of Democrats 
I talk to, don't, you know, they say not my president. They want a tougher fighting against Donald Trump. How do you think that gets worked out? Um, I think that's why she is back as leader, right? I mean, basically, uh, there are lawmakers in that caucus who said we want somebody who is prepared to do the legislative battling we need to run uh, defense for the next two years, and she knows how to do that. Um, I know that that was looked at purely through the lens of, like, elections and what does this mean for the whole party going forward, but I actually think some of that was about just, like, what is our defense going to be against this unified Republican government and therefore Donald Trump? But Susan, what do Democrats do when they're looking for their new vibrant voice of rescue uh, that's going to keep this from being a coastal party that keeps losing in those percentages? I, I talked think about. Democrats are just in a world of hurt at the moment, and they're reduced to one tactic. Their one piece play, uh, piece of leverage is the Senate filibuster. That doesn't say much for a party. If if you've lost the White House, the House, the Senate, you're going to have a Supreme Court that's going to be less friendly. You've lost all these state legislatures which may be the most serious thing. Democrats face a, a world in which they've been hollowed out. They have not, they have not have uh, people in the pipeline move up as Republicans have so skillfully done for the past 20 years. So they need to address not only the geography of their party, but also building back lower ranks of their party, state legislatures, statewide elected officials, so they have more uh, possibilities to move into the top ranks. One of the ways, Dan, that this is showing itself, the combat or the conversation of the Democratic Party is in looking back at the Clinton campaign and the way it was run. You were a part, as Susan was, of the Harvard uh, campaign managers, where the managers for all the campaigns get together. There was a real clash between the Trump forces and the Clintons. What happened and what, is the, what does it mean, not so much what happened, but what it, does it mean anything larger? Well, I think it means that this 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 campaign has left this country in such a kind of a raw state of emotion about the outcome. The outcome was a surprise, I think, on a big surprise on both sides, I think it's fair to say. Um, and the, the, the Clinton team ref reflecting both the sense, sort of sense of devastation had, had some things they wanted to put out on the table critical of the way Donald Trump ran the campaign. The Trump campaign, I think, because perhaps that they have, you know, they didn't get the popular vote. Um, they think they are not getting the respect that he deserves for having won a campaign that almost nobody said he could win. And so there, neither side seems to be really prepared to make the real steps to try to bring about reconciliation. People said this at the day after the election. Donald Trump did it, Hillary Clinton did, President of the United States did, all said, you know, the right words. But underneath that, you've got a country that's still roiled by this. There's lots of people nervous. There's lots of, there's lots of resentments and grievances on both sides. And that, that afternoon session at Harvard on Thursday afternoon, it just boiled over. And of course, you're too modest to say you were the moderator of that session. You said afterwards that you needed a fire extinguisher. And the question is, what is there that could happen? that could put out these fires that are really still raging uh, even a month after the election. Explain, Susan, though, what the fire is to people who weren't there. I mean, what the, is the central nature of it? Well, the, uh, I think on the one hand, the Trump people still pretty resentful about a lack of respect, as Don said, and the, the Clinton people arguing that they won by appealing to the darkest forces in American politics. And that was the ignition point for the fiercest exchanges that they had. But, the, you know, this, we've gone to these, these forums before where it's not like they're friendly and love each other. Yeah. It's that they're pretty civil to each other. And that sense of civility was not apparent really on either side. To get us back to the Democrats for a moment, I'll just say that there is a fire within the Democratic Party too. And there's a process through which the Democratic Party is always learning and relearning certain lessons. The big thing is that the Democratic Party is the big city party. It's the urban party. That is a huge advantage in some respects. It means that you have resources. It means that you have lots of cultural capital as well. But the tricky thing is that our political system is stacked against an urban party. When you want to win seats in the House of Representatives, and forget about the Senate, you need to be able to win some suburban or rural voters, instead of just stacking up all of your voters in big cities. Uh, that's just a fundamental challenge. And so what Nancy Pelosi managed to do, what uh, Howard Dean and other folks managed to do, is let's find Democrats who can win in these rural districts. Let's manage to do that. The thing is that the fire in the party is that urban fire of moving the party away from that. Hillary Clinton co-sponsored legislation to punish flag burning with a year in prison in 2005. Right. Although that Donald Trump wants to ago. punish people for it too, but we'll have exactly. to end it there. Thanks to all of you. We'll be back in a moment.